Hey everyone, Chris here. So the quick setup is that if you want the most powerful 10th level party possible by synergizing the character builds, I might have three builds here that do exactly that. If you watched my last video, I discussed the damage potential of spike growth by utilizing teamwork tactics. And if you watch the actual play of these three characters in the CMCC builds 10th level gauntlet run, you'll see that this isn't just whiteboard optimizing. In fact, I'll just play a short segment at the end of the video that explains why this group walked through most of the gauntlet, finishing most of the combats in one round. Treant Monk, Ramen Goblin, and Math Guy Dave have done it. They have defeated the level 10 gauntlet. In Magic the Gathering, there's a concept of a fair deck, which usually just means a non-combo deck. It doesn't necessarily mean that a combo deck is broken, even if it's quote-unquote unfair. I don't know if this build combo is broken or not, but it's certainly as close as you can get if it's not. Stay tuned for the next gauntlet when several fair yet extremely powerful builds take on the gauntlet, where you can see just how tough it can be. As for my video detailing the strategy of spike growth, as well as the two video series covering our gauntlet run with these three characters, they're all going to be linked in the video description. In that last video, I mentioned that this group is loosely based on three character builds I previously released called Grapple Death Squad, but the two other players and myself meticulously redesigned the builds to improve on reliability, damage, and versatility. So this isn't Grapple Death Squad anymore, this is the squad abling ultimate catastrophic ends, or the sauce. So the very basics are that you need three characters to pull this off. Though you could, with a larger party, include more speedy grapplers, and that would multiply the massive damage this combination pulls off. In my last video, I cautioned DMs not to let players pick their own magic items, as items like Boots of Speed take this combination from potentially broken to absolutely busted. And I must commend CMCC Builds and our DM, Ludic, for a far more sensible curated list of magic items from which we could each choose one. These magic items are absolutely unnecessary for these builds to work, but the character sheets include them, so I'll make sure to highlight what they are and what the effect of removing them would be, which is going to be pretty minor. I'm linking all three character builds in the video description, so if those are all you're after, well, there you go. In this video, what I'm going to do is cover how they work and why each decision is made. So a very quick summary, we have three characters. And we have one that is going to cast Spike Growth and maintain it. And one that will cast Haste on another party member and maintain it. And one that is going to grapple and drag creatures through the Spike Growth. In a best case scenario, this does about 500 points of damage to each grappled creature on round one. 1,000 if you do have Boots of Speed. And I go through the math in my previous video. But what I missed in my previous video was that... The grappling character has the mobile feat, which increases their base movement speed by 10, which actually has the average damage cap at 1,200, not 1,000, if you have Boots of Speed. So, I'm sorry for underselling the damage. Of course, 1,000 is a nice round number. Now, on our run-through, we didn't have Boots of Speed, and we didn't always have the best case scenario. So, the damage tended to be in the 200 points of damage to 300 points of damage, most of the time, we got the best case scenario in the final battle and did 490 points of damage in one round. So I want to put that in perspective. I normally consider my baseline damage numbers as decent damage, but not great. They're just okay. And then 150% of baseline damage I consider to be pretty good damage. And anything over 200% is great damage. And baseline damage at level 10 is 17.7. So with three party members, I would hope to do at least 53 points of damage per round. Our average, including non-ideal scenarios, was anywhere from 400 to 500% of that damage just with the spike growth and grapple dragging alone by combining the actions of these three party members. So this is amount of damage that if you had three characters that did great damage on their own, they would do half or less than half as much damage as this party actually did in combats. The flavor of the sauce was Josie and the Pussycats, a popular rock band, but by all means, come up with your own fun theme. 
So one obviously essential ingredient of the sauce is the grappler, and that is Pussycat. Here's how you make this character. So to start with, race is Tabaxi, and we're going to select for ability scores a plus two and plus one option, plus two in constitution, and plus one in strength. And our starting ability scores will be strength 16, dexterity 13, constitution 16, intelligence 8, wisdom 13, and charisma 9. There aren't going to be a lot of changes to these scores, but they pretty much provide what we need for the build. Tabaxi can be medium sized or small, and whenever you make a grappler, don't choose small because you can only grapple a creature up to one size larger than you. In fact, in order to assure that Pussycat can grapple any creature not immune to grapple, we need to be able to make this character up to huge size if need be, which we can. More on that later. We also get racial features including claws, cat's talent, which is two additional skill proficiencies, dark vision, and the most important racial feature, Feline Agility. So Feline Agility allows you to double your movement speed for your turn, and once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you move zero feet on one of your turns. Meaning, there's no real limit to the number of times you can use this feature. You just can't use it two turns in a row. We start with seven levels of fighter, and you guessed it, Rune Knight. Now, you can use Path of the Giant Barbarian, and it works okay, but I think Rune Knight is the best play here. We'll grab Athletics and Insight as skill proficiencies and Defense as our fighting style. Second Win gives the build a okay healing option. Action Surge gives us an additional action once per short rest. And depending on your situation, it might be used for attack action grapples or it might just be used to dash. That's a great use of Action Surge. Seven Levels in Rune Knight is the magical point where we get three runes and the Tasty Hill and Storm Rune options are unlocked. So our three runes. First, we have Cloud Rune, once per short rest. When you are a creature you can see within 30 feet is hit by an attack, you can use your reaction to choose a different creature within 30 feet for that attack to hit. So if your ally, who's concentrating on a very important spell, is hit with a critical hit, that's when you use your Cloud Rune and save the day and have that critical hit hit an enemy instead. Cloud Rune also gives advantage on Dexterity Sleight of Hand and Charisma Deception checks, and this is passive, so it's always on. Hill Rune allows you once per short rest to use a bonus action and gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for a minute. It also includes passive resistance to poison damage and advantage on saving throws against being poisoned. So again, always on. So if this character is taking a lot of damage, Hill Rune can keep them in the fight. Storm Rune allows you once per short rest to enter a state for one minute where you can use your reaction to provide advantage or disadvantage to an attack roll, saving throw, or ability check for either yourself or a creature within 60 feet. This provides additional protection on saving throws, always protects your saving throws, and there's also passive advantage on all your intelligence arcana checks and you're immune to being surprised. And of course, Giant's Might. This allows the character to use a bonus action to become large-sized for one minute, proficiency bonus times per long rest. So alone, this allows the character to grapple huge-sized opponents. It also gives advantage on any strength checks and saving throws. The obvious interaction here is the athletics check made to initiate a grapple is a strength check. So that check is made with advantage when Giant's Might is active. There's also a very moderate damage boost with weapon attacks or unarmed strikes, 1d6 once on your turn. Now, we won't be using Giant's Might all the time because that bonus action might be used for a dash, which can do a lot of damage, and this character doesn't need Giant's Might to grapple unless it's grappling a creature of huge size. Extra attack at 5th level is really important because grapples are a special kind of attack, so this allows this character to try again if they happen to fail on a grapple, which won't happen often. I will be showing you. Or more commonly an opportunity to grapple a second creature, which effectively doubles the drag damage, though that damage is split between two targets. But the damage is so high, you will probably kill both of them, which is exactly what happened when we tested the sauce out. Runic Shield allows the Rune Knight to use their reaction when an ally is hit with an attack roll to force a reroll of that attack. Man, Rune Knights are stacked. This can be used proficiency bonus times for long rest, and at 10th level, the proficiency bonus is plus 4, so that's 4 runic shields and 4 giants might uses. And fighters get an ability score bonus at level 4 and 6, so we take mobile, 
which allows movement after making an attack without provoking opportunity attacks, which is often the draw of this feat, but not in our case. What we really want are the other two aspects. One, our movement speed gets a plus 10 boost. That is a big damage increase. And two, if we dash through difficult terrain, and this character uses the dash action more than any other character you're ever going to play, well, then they aren't slowed by the difficult terrain, and that's huge. The other feat is Resilient Wisdom. This increases our Wisdom modifier to a plus two and provides proficiency on a very important saving throw. Make your saving throws, people. Do not ignore saving throws. You will regret it. For our final three levels, we're going to multiclass to Rogue, specifically the Soul Knife subclass, which works absolutely beautifully on this particular build. Okay, so we get one additional proficiency, which is Deception. Remember, we have advantage on that one. And Expertise in two skills, obviously, obviously, Athletics is our first choice. And then Stealth. Then we get Sneak Attack for 2d6, which is usually one of the main reasons to go Rogue. Here, it's more of a backup feature. The premier feature is maybe Expertise in Athletics, but more likely Cunning Action. This allows us to use our bonus action to dash, disengage, or hide, and 90% of the time, we're going to use it to dash. This feature has no limit in uses, so we can bonus action dash every single turn if we want to. Steady Aim allows us to use our bonus action to make an attack with advantage, but sets our speed to zero for the turn. And this actually pairs pretty nicely with Feline Agility, because when we want to restore our feline agility, we have to move zero on a turn. So might as well steady aim since we're moving zero anyways. Okay, so why soul knife? I think this will be obvious. One psionic power gives us psionic energy dice, which are d6s, and we're going to have difficulty using them all. In practice, this is basically an unlimited use feature. So, Psy Bolstered Knack allows you, when you fail an ability check using a skill or tool for which you have proficiency, to add a d6 to your roll, potentially changing the result. And if it does, you use one psionic energy die, which, like I said, are basically endless. So, the obvious thing here are grapple checks. Yeah, Soul Knife is a great multi-class for grapplers because it adds a d6 whenever they fail a grapple check. Feel free to use these on any ability check you want, though. Like I said, you just don't run out of those psionic energy dice. Oh, and this doesn't use a reaction or anything. Psychic Whispers allows us to set up telepathic communication with a number of creatures up to our proficiency bonus for a number of hours equal to the roll of a psionic energy die, which, amusingly, you don't even expend unless you're using this feature multiple times. So set up telepathy for sure. Like I said, you're not going to run out of dice. And finally, Psychic Blades. So when you take the attack action, you can manifest a Psychic Blade and attack with it. It has the Finesse property, which means it qualifies for Sneak Attack, and the Throne property, which gives you a ranged attack. It does a D6 damage plus your ability modifier, and it immediately vanishes after the attack. If your other hand is free, you can do the same thing with the bonus action, except it's a D4 damage instead of a D6. Now as written, this does not combine with extra attack, but what it does do really well is allows a character that doesn't want to be holding weapons attacks. And this character, most of the time, isn't holding weapons or shields because we want those hands free for grappling up to two targets. And the equipment for this character, very simple. Wear plate armor. You're done. In this case, Pussycat had a dagger and a rapier, just in case. They had Marusa Bomb, which is from Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, which was allowed for choosing equipment in our case, so might as well. Provides fire damage resistance for an hour. Two potions of healing, and two magic items. A Cloak of Protection, which was the choice for this character, and Mithril Plate, because another one of these characters needs no magic items, so gave Pussycat theirs. If you don't have these magic items, you'll have one lower AC, one lower saving throws, and you'll be making stealth checks with disadvantage. None of those are a huge deal. Speaking of coordination, this character also has a component pouch that they wear. Now, they don't have spells, but I'll explain why they have a component pouch when we get to the other builds. Okay, so we end up with good hit points, vital saving throws are covered, a plus 11 athletics is the primary skill, though Arcana, Deception, and Sleight of Hand all have advantage, and Stealth at plus 9 while avoiding disadvantage due to Mithril Plate is pretty good. Armor class is solid at 20, 
It would be 19 without a cloak of protection. Oh, and initiative is a very modest plus one. This is by design. Of our three party members, we want this character to go third. So stacking on initiative bonuses is normally really good, but here it's not good because we want their first turn on round one to come up and them already having been hasted and already have a spike growth down. Then this character can move up to an enemy, grapple them, use giant smite if it's required for size, and then drags them through the spike growth. And I'll go over the mechanics of all of that after the three builds are covered. So this combination obviously needs spike growth. And that brings us to character number two, Josie. So we're going to have a stark contrast with our final two characters. One of them is not multi-class at all. And the other is Josie for classes. Oh, and race, winged tiefling. So if winged tieflings are not allowed, I would probably go with one of the Dragonborn variants from Fizzbins or the Azamar to get some kind of flight that allows you to wear medium armor. Winged Tiefling is the only official option that allows you to wear medium armor and still get unlimited flight. You also get dark vision and fire resistance. And the reason you want flight on this build is purely defensive. Once spike growth is down, we really want Pussycat to be not just the best option for enemy attacks, but ideally the only option. Pussycat has a good armor class, lots of hit points, Cloud Rune, Hill Rune, they can take the hits, and they aren't concentrating on anything. A plus two ability score bonus in Charisma, and a plus one in Dexterity, and we start with a Strength of 9, Dexterity 14, Constitution 14, Intelligence 8, Wisdom 13, and Charisma 17. So we start with a Sorcerer Dip, subclass, of course, is Divine Soul. This gives Constitution saving throw proficiency, important for concentration, and favored by the gods, where you add another 2d4 to a saving throw if necessary once per short rest. You can use it for attack rolls too, but don't. Save it for saving throws. Starting skills, deception and persuasion, and we'll grab less as our extra spell. Now we can't use it if we're concentrating on spike growth, but there are a few situations where the tactic might not be applicable, and bless gives us another solid option. I'll go over the cases where you won't be able to use this strategy later in the video. As for the rest of the spells, there's a lot of spells on this character, and I'll go over all of them together at the end. But we'll take our first multi-class and take three levels of Warlock, subclass Genie Dao. This gives us access to the essential Spike Growth spell, and we stop at level three because we have two second level pack slots. That's two more Spike Growths every short rest. Josie can cast Spike Growth in every single combat. She does four additional bludgeoning damage once per turn when she hits with an attack roll, and she can retreat to her bottle of respite as an action once per long rest. She grabs Eldritch Mind and Agonizing Blast with Invocations. Now, we discuss this because it is tempting here to take Repelling Blast. After all, Repelling Blast and Spike Growth are a well-known combination. But what we determined was if damage by Spike Growth is possible in a combat, 10 or 20 feet that we get from Repelling Blast is insignificant compared to the hundreds of feet of dragging by our first character. But Agonizing Blast adds damage in every combat, whether Spike Growth is used or not. And Eldritch Mind gives advantage on concentration saving throws, and we don't want to lose Spike Growth. And her Pact, Pact of the Talisman. This allows the wearer to add a D4 to a failed ability check four times for long rest. And you guessed it, Josie doesn't keep the talisman, it goes right to Pussycat. Yet another insurance policy on potentially failed grapple checks. And we're not done on those, by the way. Next multi-class. Yeah, a filthy peace cleric dip. This had my mild disapproval as I think peace is a broken subclass and I feel dirty when I take it, but I didn't make this build, I didn't take it. And I couldn't argue it's a great dip here. We add a spellcasting progression level, a bunch more spells, a free insight skill proficiency, but most importantly, emboldening bond. So this is way overpowered for a first level feature, but basically you can use this outside of combat and give your party a D4 on saving throws, ability checks, and attack rolls once per turn for 10 minutes. And when it runs out, use it again. You have four uses per long rest. So there's a ton of heavy lifting here, 
Everyone's saving throws get a nice boost. It's like a permanent bless. Attack rolls really don't come up a lot with this group, but ability checks do, like grapple. So yet another layer of insurance on grappling. So if Pussycat fails a grapple check, they just keep adding dice until they succeed. And honestly, it almost feels like cheating. Okay, in our fourth class, five levels in Bard, subclass, Glamour. So add the Perception skill, then five levels of spellcasting progression. And level five is really nice for Bards because their Inspiration die scales to a D8 and they get them back on short rests. So give Pussycat Inspiration. And you guessed it, yet another layer of insurance. We put all our eggs in one basket, so we made sure that basket was made of friggin' steel. And Jack of All Trades adds half proficiency to any ability check where we don't have proficiency, infamously including initiative rolls. Song of Rest increases healing on a short rest, expertise in stealth and perception. A feat at level 4 is Fate Touched, so Charisma jumps to plus 4. And so, why Glamour Bard? Because of Mantle of Inspiration. As a bonus action, spend one use of Bardic Inspiration to grant eight temporary hit points to up to four creatures you can see within 60 feet. Okay, but here's the important part. Each creature can immediately use its reaction to move up to its speed without provoking opportunity attacks. The obvious use of this, as far as we were concerned, is additional dragging with grapples by Pussycat. In practice, we found this was far more useful, allowing our characters to escape webs and avoid being decimated by velociraptors. Mantle of Inspiration is a feature that does not get enough attention, and it makes the Glamour Bard a very solid subclass, but the interaction here with the grapple and drag and the extra dash is especially nice. So here's the spells you end up with. Which class provided which spell is up on your screen. So cantrips. Josie has a lot of cantrips. Eldritch Blast, of course, Firebolt, Guidance, Light, Mage Hand, Magic Stone, Message, Minor Illusion, Prestidigitation, Resistance, Spare the Dying, and Vicious Mockery. That's 12 cantrips. Josie has four first level slots and has Absorb Elements, Bless, Command, Cure Wounds, Detect Magic, Gift of Alacrity, Healing Word, Heroism, Long Strider, Sanctuary, actually Sanctuary twice, but the Cleric one was automatic and it doesn't have a good save DC. So, take it again with Warlock. And Shield, of course, and Silvery Barbs because we are shameless. And Thunder Wave. So, a lot of this is obvious, but Gift of Alacrity is cast on Josie and party member number three, but not on Pussycat for the reasons previously stated. Pussycat gets Long Strider, though, because, of course. Second level spells. So, three spell slots and two pack slots. So, that's five second level spells and two more with every short rest. Naturally used on spike growth. Now we're gonna add aid, which can be upcast well, so it doesn't use up second level spells. Lesser restoration, you know, just in case. Mirror image for another layer of protection. Misty step with one free casting from Fae Touched. And of course, spike growth through Dao Genie Warlock. So third level spells. We have three slots, and the spells are Catnap and Hypnotic Pattern. So why Catnap? Because this party has a lot of features and spell effects that last an hour. And Catnap allows you to slip in a short rest without those features and spells running out. And Hypnotic Pattern because sometimes you need it instead of Spike Growth. And one 4th level slot, no 4th level spells. Aid Upcast is a good option, as is Upcasting Command to affect 4 targets. So Josie had a Sentinel Shield, which is nice. It gives advantage on initiative and immunity to being surprised, but it's not essential to this character. We have some circumstantial stuff like antitoxins and ball bearings, caltrips, lots of caltrips. Uh, Josie wears a breastplate, has a dagger, a healing kit, three potions of healing, a short sword that she'll never use, probably, thieves tools, two applications of willow shade oil, also a weird explorer's guide to wild mount item that is very circumstantial. You don't need to worry about it. Oh, and of course, a component pouch. So 71 hit points is okay. Strong concentration saves, decent in a lot of skills, very good at perception and stealth, solid 18 armor class with the shield spell as a backup, and yeah, let's move on. Tomcat Jones is party member number three, and this one is purely my build and the character that I played. Character race, Plasmoid. I put a plus one in charisma, dexterity, and constitution. 
Starting scores were Strength 8, Dexterity 16, Constitution 15, Intelligence 10, Wisdom 8, and Charisma 16. You can choose medium or small size. I chose small size and you'll see why. We get Dark Vision, we can hold our breath for an hour, we have resistance to both acid and poison damage, and advantage on saving throws against being poisoned. We can use Shape Self to be vaguely humanoid, in my case, vaguely tabaxi-like. And we can use a Uzi Pseudopod as a bonus action to manipulate objects or items up to 10 feet away. And the key racial feature, our showstopper, Amorphous. This allows Tomcat Jones to squeeze through a space as narrow as one inch wide as long as he's not wearing or carrying anything. And he has advantage on ability checks to initiate or escape a grapple. So we want to use Amorphous with his character. And that means that normally this character is wearing nothing and holding nothing. More on that later. So straight class, 10 levels in Creation Bard. Skill proficiencies in Investigation, Perception, and Athletics. And expertise in Investigation, Perception, and Athletics. Okay, so I did Investigation because it's an important skill and nobody else was good at it. But we can get a plus 8, and that's not bad. And Athletics because we can be a backup grappler. If we're fighting a bunch of weaker enemies, as long as they're not bigger than medium size, we might be waiting for a while for a grappler to shred them two at a time. With racial advantage on grapple checks, that's plus seven with advantage. That's not bad. Bardic inspiration, and these are D10s, yet more layers of insurance. And creation gets little bonuses depending on how you use it. Like, for example, if you use bardic inspiration to add a D10 to say, I don't know, an athletics check to grapple, you roll two D10s, and then you take the better result. So we have insurance on insurance on insurance. Performance of creation is a fantastic feature. Watch our run-through to see how I used it. That's the kind of way you want to use it. Battlefield control with no concentration. If I go through all the ways it can be used, that's a separate video. Animating performance allows you to animate an object of up to large size. And it gets a stat block and a fly speed, and you can command it with your bonus actions. And we will have a set use for this, and I'm going to come back to that. And magical secrets. So Tomcat Jones has two primary jobs. One, cast haste on Pussycat before Pussycat's first turn. And two, never lose the spell. If you lose haste, then Pussycat loses their turn. We do not want that to happen. So bards don't get haste, and that's where Magical Secrets comes in. So we take haste, and we will take Flying Greater Steed. And two feats. So first, Resilient Constitution. That brings our Constitution modifier up to a plus three and gives us proficiency in those saves, so it protects our concentration. And alert, because we need to go before Pussycat. I can't stress how important the haste spell is to this whole combination. Haste not only doubles Pussycat's movement, which alone doubles the damage, but also gives an additional dash action. So haste more than doubles the damage. Grapple and Drag does a lot of damage with spike growth, but haste plus spike growth is what makes this combination just so deadly and gets those numbers so, so high. So spells on this character, we got Cantrips, our Mage Hand, Mending, Minor Illusion, and Vicious Mockery. First level, we have four slots, and I took Featherfall, Healing Word, Longstrider, and Silvery Barbs, because, once again, I'm shameless, but Longstrider frees up some first level slots from Josie. Notice none of these spells use concentration, and this is so they can be cast while concentrating on haste. Second level, three slots, and I have Aid, Enlarge, Reduce, and Mirror Image. And I need to talk a little bit about Enlarge, Reduce, because if we're fighting a gargantuan creature... Well then, Pussycat can only turn to large and can't grapple it, but Enlarge Reduce can make Pussycat huge-sized as long as they've already used Giant's Might. Now, that means no haste spell, so 500 damage goes down to about 200 damage. But still, 200 damage. Definitely better than anything else we can do. And at third level, we've got Haste and Dispel Magic and Lehman's Tiny Hut. Lehman's, of course, doesn't use up a spell slot when cast as a ritual, because you should expect to use all three slots here on haste. Fourth level, we got Dimension Door, Fine Greater Steed, which you can use for a Pegasus or a Griffin, your choice, and Polymorph, just in case. 
And at fifth level, we've got two slots and animate objects in case we're not using spike growth. And we want animate objects because if we have a case where we can't use spike growth, we're going to need some damage. By the way, when we played, I spent half my fourth level and fifth level slots on, you guessed it, haste. So inventory. Tomcat Jones wears nothing and holds nothing, but he has a cart. It's 10 feet by 10 feet. When Tomcat uses animating performance, it's on the cart. Gives us a flying cart. And in that cart are four chests. They're each five feet by five feet. And each of those chests is locked. And the keyhole is, you guessed it, one inch wide. The Pegasus or Griffin pulls the cart. And in a couple of the chests, Tomcat has some occasionally useful circumstantial equipment. Here's the list. But none of these items are necessary. So Tomcat ends up with decent hit points and saving throws, a couple of resistances, a lot of skills and spells, a great plus 10 initiative, plus a d8 from Gift of Alacrity, and an abysmal 13 armor class. And that is not a problem because Tomcat Jones hangs out inside the chests because he's small sized and he fits. That's full cover, baby. The chests can be attacked and they can be destroyed, but that's attacks that are not at Tomcat. And the chests have a surprisingly good 19 armor class. And if one gets destroyed, Tomcat just seeps into one of the other three chests. And I can hear some of you typing right now. What about material components? You need to hold a focus or have a component pouch. Okay, so a lot of my spells don't have material components, so I don't need material components for them. But some do, including haste. Fortunately, I have several options. First, there is a flute sitting in the cart, not in a chest. So I can just touch the flute. Second, if I'm either by Josie or by Pussycat, I can just use their component pouches. That's why Pussycat has a component pouch, in case I'm nearby. And third, if I'm out of reach, I can use my bonus action to create a pseudopod to grab those components up to 10 feet away. Having the material component was never an issue, and I did keep track. So you want to protect haste, you want to make yourself an impossible target, and it worked like a charm. Oh, and in one case, I found myself out of a chest and facing some potential attacks, and Josie used Mantle of Inspiration, so I could seep right back in. The features of these three characters are designed to work together. Okay, so those are the three builds. Now let's talk tactics. And we're going to start with a setup. So we're going to set up telepathy. We're going to give inspiration. We're going to hand off the talisman. Do emboldening bond. Do gift of alacrity and cast long strider. With initiative, Josie's going to be rolling at plus four with advantage and then adds a d8 from alacrity and a d4 from bond. Tomcat rolls at plus 10 and then adds a d8 and a d4. And Pussycat rolls at plus 1 and doesn't use the bond for the d4. In every single fight, Josie and Tomcat went first, and the order between those two characters does not matter at all. We have spike growth down, fly to safety if possible, seep out of chest, cast haste, seep back in, and Pussycat is all set up at the start of their turn. So on their turn, Pussycat grapples one or two enemies. If they somehow fail the check, even though they have a plus 11 with advantage, they can add dice from Bond, Psychic Knack, Talisman, and Inspiration. So they just keep adding dice until they succeed. And then they're going to use Feline Agility to double their movement speed. Now, the base speed is 30. Then we're going to add 10 from Mobile, 10 more from Longstrider, and so that's a base speed of 50. Feline Agility doubles that to 100. Haste doubles it again to 200. Now we have half speed while grappling and dragging, so that reduces it back down to 100. That's 100 damage on average while dragging an enemy through a spike growth. A dash action adds another 100 damage. A bonus action dash with cunning action, 100 damage. Hasted action dash, 100 damage. Reaction move with Mantle of Inspiration, 100 damage. Action Surge Dash, 100 damage. Everything dies. And we're talking about one round here. Now, we want to be flexible depending on our situation. So the bonus action might be used to become large sized. Haste might need to be replaced with something like Enlarge Reduce. If Pussycat needs to fly up to an enemy, well, they could use the Pegasus or the animated cart to fly up 
Then they could shove an enemy prone. Enemy would fall. Pussycat falls down next to them and grapple them. But that's going to use up their base movement. So it creates less shredding damage, but it's still going to be in the hundreds. The sauce has an answer for almost every situation. And spike growth ends up being not all that circumstantial at all. Now, I mentioned there might be cases where it can't be used. So here are the ones I can think of. If you're flying like way up high in the air and you're doing combat or you're stuck in a really small space or you're underwater and the seabed is like way, way below you or you're fighting something like wraiths that can't be grappled. Well, in those cases, we're not going to use spike growth. But we have Eldritch Blasts, Animated Objects, Hypnotic Patterns, and Psychic Blades. It is still a solid party, but in those few cases, you're not going to do broken damage. In pretty much every other situation, the sauce shreds enemies to pieces, usually in one round. And if you have more than three party members, then make another Fast Grappler, and if you have another party member, another one that can cast Haste. And that is how you make the sauce. And if you like this content, consider supporting this channel through Patreon, linked in the video description. Today I'd like to thank Arden, Awesome Face, Benjamin, Chris Campion, Christophe, Condor, Crimson Citizen, Dash Panther, Dave Peters, David Lotz, David W. Skibbins, Aaron, Eric H., Gabe C., Ido, Isaac Leister, Jake Kimball, James Thomas, Jeremy Brown, Jonathan Lexi, KJ Aurelio, Nuts, Quath, Leonardo Gonzalez, Migish, Richten Stahl, Rye Squy, Starfall, Stephen Edmondson, TUM, The Algor Rhythm, Tim Gerbafak, and Trex. And until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. I'll talk to you soon.